Settle down, people. Settle Ooh, down. We have, we haven't, even, haven't even brought our guests in yet. They're already, I mean, they're on their on their feet, clapping. Hey. Jackal Monkey, how are this you, sir? Good. I'm Otis B. Dreads, as you all know. This is Jackal Monkey here, and this is Night 11 Dreads. This is uh, one of those shows that we're uh, not only broadcasting over to the Night of the Living Dreads Facebook group, but also over there to Scurry Face as well. So uh, a lot of people waiting for our guests before we get, you know, and bring our guest, Mr. Robert, a.k.a. Bobby Ray Schaefer or Bob Vance from Vance Refrigeration, as most people may know him. Um, before we get into uh, uh, all of that good discussion, Nightmare Ninja Studios, my friend. Where tell people where they can get a mask. Yeah, uh, hit me up on Facebook, Nightmare Ninja Studios. Uh, do all kinds of custom latex pieces. Uh, do some hockey masks, Hannibal Lecter masks. So, I mean, if you need a custom mask made, hit me up, and we'll make your nightmares become a reality. Jeez. If you have a film that you're working on and you need a mask or a prop, hit me up, and hit we'll make up. your nightmares become a reality. He's got all kinds of nightmares for your reality. Oh, just, just yeah, and of course, <laughs> and of course, Night of the Living Dreads, the audio podcast. All of these uh, interviews will be on our YouTube uh, channel. And uh, man, we we've had some really good uh, uh, guests, some awesome guests here here lately. And tonight is not going to be. Any no different, exception. no different. Again, you probably know our guests from The Office. That's right, Bob Vance, Vance's Refrigeration. You may also know him as the deranged, satanic, you know, devil worshiping psycho cop in Psycho Cop One and Two. Uh, and you also may know him as Dick Dixter. What a great name, by the way. <laughs> love it. Love it. What, what, a, what, a, what an awesome name. What an awesome name. So without further ado, let's bring in Mr. Robert Ray Shaw. Robert, how are you, sir? I'm fine. Thank you, Otis. Jacko, good evening. Good Thank day, you, everybody listening. This this is this is going to be a this is going to be a fun funny show, I believe. I've watched some of your interviews. I've got some little points that I want to bring up. Um, let's just start from the beginning. You were born, I, I you said, in West Virginia, but you grew up as a child in Bowie, Maryland. I did live there a few years. Uh, yeah. Bowie and Wheaton, Silver Spring, you know, that whole I, area. I I actually, my grandmother's house is about 20, 25 minutes from Bowie in Glen Burnie. Have you heard of that? Sure. Yes. Uh, so I thought that that was, that was, that was kind of cool. Are you an Orioles fan? I uh, was a Senators fan. Okay. Uh, that was when they still had the original Senators. Frank Hondo Howard played first base, the Washington Monument, six foot eight. Had 40 home runs a year. Uh, yeah, no, I, I I love that team. I remember they sent me uh, a bunch of autographed pictures. You know, I wrote them a letter, please send me pictures, and about 10 guys on the team did. So that was my first experience with uh, fame was uh, pictures from the Senators. That, that's, that, awesome. That, that, that's awesome. That's yeah. that's awesome. Um, so growing up, I heard you were a big Happy Days fan uh growing up i i love me some happy days when i was growing up 
uh, along with Happy Days, were you a Carol Burnett fan? Because I think I heard something about Carol Burnett was maybe supposed to be in a movie or you were going to possibly, maybe she was thought about playing a role. She again. wanted to be on The Office. I mean, oh. the, at the first Emmy uh, in 2006, when we won the Emmy Award, she got a Lifetime Achievement Award there. And uh, when she was giving her speech, she told the executive producer, Greg Daniels, I'd like to be on the show. Well, at the time, he said, we can't have Carol Burnett on the show. It would She's too famous. It would ruin the authenticity of the show. And, of course, later on, everybody in the Hollywood did a cameo. <laughs> so right. that went out the window. You know, we can't have famous people on the show. That that sailed away. But, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, I was like, get Car Carol Burnett. Yeah, let's get Carol Burnett. Let's let's make her Bob Vance's mother. <laughs> right? That would have been awesome. Working That's with a legend like Carol Burnett, I mean, such a gifted farceur. I mean, really, oh there's very goodness. few women in that category, and she was one of them. That 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 is awesome. So I guess you were a big fan of the Carol Burnett show back in the late '60s, early '70s. What else was on TV that night? It was Saturday <laughs> I mean, night, true. right? There was three channels. There wasn't much on, and you know, Kaitel, uh, not Kaitel, uh, Harvey, Harvey, uh, yeah. and Tim Conway. I mean, oh. they uh, they were very funny, very gifted. Uh, that stuff still holds up. Some of those bits. Oh are, yeah. You know, that comedy will live on. I mean, it still works. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to take a quick second. Thank everybody for joining us in the chat. Again, we're over there. Scurry face over there at NLD. Thank you all for joining in uh, with our discussion with uh, Sir Bobby Ray Shaver, Bob Vance. Come on. Tell, tell us who you are. I know people are waiting to, <laughs> to hear this. You know, I've only been saying this line for 16 years now, so I've, I've, you know, I say it the same way I said it on the first time I walked on the show in 2005, Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration, that's you know, awesome. who knew? I mean, that's 17 seconds of uh, comedy gold. It actually uh, was number five on a top 10 list of best office moments. I, oh, you know, yeah. I never would have thought that. I mean, so that was a sweet, I mean, everybody's got a list, right? But still, it's uh, kind of a surprise. And, uh, you know, the merchandising of the character, who knew? I mean, there's no way to know that sort of thing. And uh, I always say, you know, really, I did the most with the least. <laughs> so it, it's a thrill and it's an honor. I mean, we're, we're doing things with that show now. I mean, that no one in TV history has ever done. I mean, it's it's bigger now than when we were making it way bigger. And uh, so who knew that? I mean, uh, that's a big surprise. So it's been a wonderful ride. I'll say that, uh, you know, every bit of it's been a blessing. It's tough when you're doing it because, you know, as a recurring character, you want to be a, a regular, uh, you want more, 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 you want more scenes, more lines. Right. I mean, so it, it, it's a double edged sword, you know, I mean, you're thrilled with the piece, but you're also, you know, you like uh, when I play basketball, I like to take the shot. <laughs> you know, right. I, wanted, I wanted to right. jack it up. I didn't want, uh, I didn't, you know, I, I like to pass the ball too, but you know, I wanted to be the guy shooting it. So you, you want to take the shot, you know, so it's kind of tough to sit the bench, you know, that's the one aspect of it that people don't understand, but it, mm -hmm. it uh, you know, it, from, for an actor, uh, when you're out about, uh, you know, out in the world and people go, wait, wait, I know you. And now you can just go, the office <laughs> you know you don't have to explain yourself well i did a commercial with kenny rogers i did psycho cop i, I was on criminal minds i did you know adam ruins everything hold I mean, on you go through your resume you can just go to the office you, and then you're you, done with it you did a commercial with kenny rogers yeah i did the gambler for geico yeah yeah it was a great spot i mean yeah. it was a great day um you know a, how could you ever have a better day? You're working with Kenny Rogers. You, you know, right. I'm sitting, I'm in awe of Kenny Rogers. I mean, this guy has done it all. He's a huge talent. I used to bartend on Sunset Boulevard in a building owned by Kenny Rogers. I mean, when wow. I brought that up in our conversation, he was very pleased. <laughs> oh, yes, he was happy he owned that building. But, you know, I mean, I learned stuff. I mean, he told me that, for instance, uh, Islands in the Stream, the, the number one smash hit single with Dolly Parton, that's, that was yep. an accident. 
He just happened to be in the recording studio that day. Dolly walked in. He said, hey, will you sing on this record with me? And she said, yes. And then, voila. <laughs> Magic. That's awesome. I mean, that's one of the, you know, that's that song. I mean, it's brilliant. It still works. I mean, uh, Anna sold millions and millions of, of copies. Yes, it, yes, it did. Yes, it did. You know, um, Kenny Rogers discovered the Eagles. You know, I mean, Kenny did. Rogers, uh, you know, but was not only a great singer, writer, but he was also a great actor. I mean, he, he did it all. I mean, what didn't he do? I mean, he had, a long, he had 40 years uh, at the top of the, at the top of the game at all the different games. So, you know, I have nothing but mad respect. And it was a, it was an awesome experience to not only meet him, but, you know, <laughs> hang out. That, that's great. Speaking of the office, and then I want to hand it over to Jackal Monkey because uh, apparently it is a thing in their household that they watch the office on a religious sure. level. Sure. Um, but my 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 son CJ, he's a, he's a junior. My son, uh, he he texts me a question because he's also a huge fan of the office. He wants to, he's also a huge horror fan. Now, Rain Wilson, as you know, you know, had that part in uh, the House of a Thousand Corpses, the Rob Zombie horror film. What was it like working with him? Is, is he, is, what kind of a character is, is Rain, he? Rain is an eccentric guy, you know, but he's a very smart man. Mm -hmm. um, I have much respect for him and his choices as well. He, you know, he proves himself in lots of different ways all the time. Uh, I'm impressed by Rain Wilson. Awesome. Awesome. So, I, I mean, what, what kind of cut-ups? Because uh, I, 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 know, I know there was all kinds of bloopers and outtakes. I think, Jackal Monkey, you wanted to know a little bit about that. So I'll ask that and then... Jackal Monkey, the floor is yours when it comes to the office because we're getting ready to get into some psycho cop and sure. Dick Dickster. Well, so. the, the thing, uh, awesome. Otis, awesome, is that people didn't really blow takes, right? I mean, you're on such a tight schedule that you don't take the liberty of blowing a take. You want to do it, you know, as best you can. Now, John and Rain and Steve would occasionally switch something around to try to make each other laugh. And that would make the outtakes. And of course, everyone always had outtakes on their, every single, that's what she said. I mean, <laughs> the fact that we were even able to do, uh, that's what she said. I mean, <laughs> they put them all together one night at one of our rap parties and there was probably a hundred of them in a row. And no one has ever laughed harder than we did that night. We packed ourselves up. <laughs> oh, bad. More than the audience ever laughed at the show. We thought we were funny. And, you know, a lot of the time we were. Yeah, um, and that was one thing I was wanting to ask, too. Um, your, your mom and dad are actually named Bob and Phyllis, right? That is correct, and that is well done research. I mean, what are the odds of that? In fact, Phyllis's name is Phyllis Smith. My mother's maiden name was Phyllis Smith. So oh, it was really no. weird. It, you know, the first time I learned that, I said, is your middle name Kay? Because <laughs> that was my mother's <laughs> middle name. I was like, if your middle name is Kay, I'm really going to have a... <laughs> right. I'm going to have a little middle breakdown here. <laughs> and the odd thing is, is that I had read for Phyllis uh, maybe five years before that. Uh, you know, she was a casting director. And uh, a really good one. I mean, she worked for Allison Jones. Allison Jones is the top comedy casting director in Los Angeles. She does all the Will Ferrell movies. She does all the oh, big wow. A-list movies. Allison Jones. So that's how Phyllis got the job. And the funny thing was is that for years, while the show was on and then afterwards, every casting director's office that I would go into would say, did you know Phyllis was the casting director? <laughs> and I always had to go, yes, <laughs> yes, I knew, I know that Phyllis was making 30K a year and suddenly wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> suddenly she was buying Mary Tyler Moore's old house in the hills in Hollywood. Wow. wow. That's awesome, though. Yeah, I mean, no, it was, a, it was the, you know, the first director loved her, all, loved her readings so much that he said, you need to be in the show. You know, uh, Creed was a background guy the first time, and he cut a tape 
that he got to he, he convince Greg Daniels to watch and he got on the show full time. And of course, you know, you can't think of the office without Creed. Oh, I mean, right. Think about that. Absolutely. I mean, Creed had an incredible impact on the show. Oh, you know, yeah. Creed's one of my favorite people. He was a huge rock and roll star when he was a young man. Right, in the grassroots. The grassroots. They had a bunch of hits. I mean, that sooner or later. I wow. Mean, uh, Midnight Temptation. I mean, uh, tons of number ones. I mean, I used to listen to them when I was a little kid on Casey Kasem's Top 40 radio show every week, you know, and uh, he, he and uh, Ed Helms would always sit around on the set and play their guitars. I mean, they were very entertaining. Oh, I bet. Oh, I sure. imagine. They're and both I would always want to talk to him about the old days. I want to talk to him about it when he, when he was a rock and roll star. You know? Yeah, right. Now, right. Hear this, you know, story. ET you know. build on The Office. Right, right. Yeah, yeah I mean, geez, you, you imagine the stories he's got. You know what I mean? Well, like, he was in rock and roll when rock and roll was real. Right. When exactly. rock and roll wasn't corporate rock and roll, when rock and roll wasn't pre-manufactured and auto-tuned and, you know, guys really got out and played. You know, I mean, it was a different era in music for sure. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And those are the stories that, you know, you, you kind of want to hear. Um, let me ask you about this. We're going to we're going to step away from the office. Sure. Just just for a moment, because I heard you mention in another interview that you actually pitched a bowling comedy movie that turned into kingpin yes tell us about that well i i just loved bowl i was in a bowling league at the time and i was writing a lot of comedies at the time and uh and i hadn't learned to keep my mouth shut <laughs> you know, i was still join the crowd those days. <laughs> so you go out to hollywood parties and you run into producers and you you know you pitch them you know Here's what I did. You know, I wrote a script in every single genre. You know, I had a horror film. I had a romantic comedy. I had an action picture. I had a, you know, a, a futuristic space picture. I mean, I wrote uh, something in every genre. So <laughs> then whenever I would pitch, I would say, listen, what are you looking for? Are you looking for an action film? And they would go, no, no, I'm really looking for a romantic comedy. That way, then I would go, I happen to have one. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's so awesome. Just writers exercise more than anything, you know. But pitching, you know, that happens every single day. And, you know, um, my idea was pretty much the same as the movie. The movie's genius. Kingpin is one of my favorite movies. I love I it. I mean, it's so, it's so good. Uh, so funny. It, and it holds up. I mean, uh, Peter, I met Peter Firely uh, when uh, my buddy Nick Vallelonga was doing Green Book. So, you know, very good director. Uh, obviously, those guys, have, they're comic, comic geniuses, really. I mean, that's right. why it was such a great departure to see him do Green Book. And every now and then, his comic stuff would just start to creep in. You know, he couldn't help it. And you got Vigo Mortensen, you know. I don't know if you've seen Green Book, but it's a wonderful little picture. And uh, Well, it's an Academy Award winner. <laughs> right. So apparently it's a good picture. Um, now, Jack O'Monkey, I have to throw this in before I forget it. I saw you, Bobby, rap on <laughs> a, another interview that you did. Can you do that for us right now? Because wow, that is I, pressure, you know, just to say it, it is. Okay, rap. It is. Let me, let me set it up first and see if okay. I can recall the words. It's been a while since I've done it. It, it the rap has to do with with Psycho Cop Three. We you know mm -hmm. I wrote the script for Psycho Cop Three. I, I, for years people have been saying to me, "Please make another one. Please make another one." I agree. And I didn't really want to. I, I was like, "Eh, I've already done it. What else can I do with it?" And so finally, um, what motivated me was I heard somebody wanted to remake it. I was like, oh, no. oh no. Oh no. hell no, that's mine. Don't touch that. <laughs> you know, I got I got really possessive all of a sudden. I was like, what do you mean remake it? <laughs> right. I'm still I alive, like and, Dick, you know, Dick I'm still Spare, man. You know. And so uh I, I wrote it. It, it was it, it's hip hop psycho cop. He, that crazy ass crack is gonna shoot you if you smoke that rock. Bang, boom, he in the room, he got his nine out laughing and he <laughs> and got his nine out blazing and he laughing too. Fuck you, boy in blue. 
<laughs> love it. Love well, it. Well, Psycho Cop uh, 3, it's, I wanted to make a really dark, scary horror film. I mean, not at a very old school horror film. I, I don't want to make a gore porn or, you know, a, a comedy. I mean, Psycho Cop still says funny things, but it's in a much tenser setting because he's actually harvesting uh, the guilty and sending them to hell. He talks on his iPhone to state Satan all the way through the film. <laughs> no, it's, you know, we brought it, it into the, to the modern, modern times. Love it, love it. Yeah, this, well, yeah, this, this has got to happen. I, I mean, I love the idea. You know, there's a lot of the book of Revelations in it. I don't know if you're familiar with that book in the Bible, but that's the end right. times. And uh, police officer Joe Vickers is very well versed in the book of Revelations. <laughs> yes, yes, awesome, yeah. awesome. So, yeah, so it, like it, I said, much darker, much it, darker. Is this something that we could potentially see in the near future? It is. It's really a, just a question of the financing. And, you know, do we all want to get together and make it? Can we clear our schedules enough to make it and agree on when to make it? I mean, that's, there's, you know, a few little, few, few little roadblock, like the money. Right, right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that, 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 other than that, that one. you know, I mean, listen, it's a guaranteed winner. I mean, there's no way you lose money on it. None. Zero, yeah. Zero chance yeah. of that. So it would be nice to have uh, three of them, you know, so you could then box them together and sell the, them. The a, trilogy. A no, yeah. uh, um, absolutely. I mean, if, if it was me, if I owned it, I do not own it. I'm just the star of it. You know, there's an right. executive producer. <laughs> there always is. So, you know, we'll see what he wants to do. But Nick Vallelonga, who I mentioned previously who won the Academy Award for Green Book, who was Mike in Psycho Cop Returns. He's indicated that he'd be interested in being part of it. And also Adam Rifkin, who directed Psycho Cop Returns. So awesome. I'd love to work with Rifkin again. You know, we had a screening of the film uh, last oh, a year ago in Hollywood at this you know prestigious screening room. It was packed. <laughs> it was full. It was the first time we'd ever screened the full print of the director's cut. And this film <laughs> completely worked. It just dominated. It was fantastic to watch it with a, you know, a discerning film loving audience. And it, the first time we'd ever seen it that way. And so uh, every kill worked, every joke worked. I mean, it was a, a very heady evening. And the best part of the evening was the director of Maniac Cop was there. Mr. Bill oh, Lustig. Now, I never cool met him, man. you know, and I never even watched Maniac Cop. I've been asked about it, you know, for years. And uh, people always used to come up to me and say, hey, um, in a fight between Psycho Cop and Maniac Cop, who would win? And <laughs> so I told Lustig, I said, you know, people have been asking me this for 25 years. Who would win? And he goes, well, I said, you're looking at him. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you, you know, got the devil. You don't on get your the chance side. to drop one-liners on you know people every, uh, as often as you'd like, but when you do, you got to take them. Well, you, right. uh, you, you 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 know, uh, Bobby. I I mean that that was something else I was going to bring up, and that was you know when you read your lines for Psycho Cop One and Psycho Cop Returns Part Two. You had to have said to yourself, this this is the most one-liners. I mean, did you guys set a record? It seemed like every line that you blurted was a one-liner. I, I didn't Looking think of it that way. You know, I, I you was know. just trying to figure out how to make him, how to say him, you know, in character. I mean, you're not really thinking uh, of the uh, impact of them. They're just, you know, they're just lines that you're saying as you, go through the uh, journey with this character. Right. And the character changed a lot from the first one mm. to the second one, you know, and mm. uh, I mean, the tone changed, the directors changed. I mean, a lot of it changed. Right. And so I was just trying to stay afloat and find the thing that worked best for me. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, uh, it's still me <laughs> up there. Right. The thing. So yeah. I have to protect myself, you know, and also reach accommodation with, you know, the director and the producer. And although I had a lot of free reign on that film, I didn't really have to explain anything. I just did it. Right. You know? That's so <laughs> I'm, I'm not an actor that asks for uh, direction. You know, if they have something to say to me, uh, I've got it already figured out. You know, I mean, I'm ready to go when I get there. I don't need uh, positive reinforcement from you. I have right. to make the choices. 
Right. And then I also have to execute them on screen. I mean, you know, I, I, certain times you would react bigger to certain things, uh, but you're in a tiny little, you know, tight frame that you can't move your head at all. They say, don't move. Whatever you do, don't move. So you, you have to adjust accordingly to what the camera is, is seeing. Your performance is dictated by the lens, you know, uh, and that's something you have to learn over time is how to modulate that correctly. You, you watch the big, great actors, uh, film actors, they, they know exactly how to, how little you need to do. I mean, it's the amateur that uh, doesn't understand, you know, the stillness that's necessary and that uh, an actor acts with their eyes, not with their head. You know, I mean, that's the one you see all this movement from people. That's a huge mistake. I mean, the stillness is what, uh, what really works. So right. that's what you're striving to learn how to do is to control those things. And that's what I was going to ask also is, uh, did you have any kind of uh, any one particular or a, uh, a few different particular horror icons that you sort of uh, kind of got inspiration from? When well, sure, you sure. Of course. I mean, you know, Vincent Price and uh, Christopher Lee and those guys, they were uh, they love their madness. And so that's what Psychopop right. does. Is he loves his madness. I mean, that's all it is. And I want to have fun. Right. I don't want to be a uh, gloomy time. I want us to have a, a, a pleasant time together. So that's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the trick in that is, you know, to switch from being somewhat normal to being psycho in a, in a, in a breath, you know, right. without, without effort, without people seeing you do that. So that's the, that's the trick. That's all awesome. how to do that. It's easy. Right. And, and, and that's what <laughs> easy I was telling you. Anybody like can do it. Right, right. That's what I was telling Otis. Like, I, I mean, I like the first one. Don't get me wrong, but part two, part two, Psycho Cut. Like, it instantly became a classic to me. I was, I was like, yeah, I no. love this fucking movie. Well, this you've got Julie so Strain good. and Melanie Good, and you know, some naked girls running around. It's not hard <laughs> on the eyes. <laughs> and 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 speaking of naked girls, why don't we just jump right into Dick Dickster? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> why, why don't why don't you uh, for those who haven't seen it? I I've been you know trying to get people up Thank to speed you. with with this movie. Yeah, because it's it's so I, awesome. I think Thank it's it. an instant cult comedy classic. You would think, right? I mean, it hasn't found that audience yet, but I believe it will. Uh, I just you know when that's it. the question. But you know, it's a funny thing. Like we were talking about, Psycho Cop returns. I waited twenty five years for the reviews. Okay? Wow. Yeah, no, I mean, when they released wow. it, uh, Vinegar Syndrome put it out in a director's cut. Right. Um, Blu-ray release. That I got reviewed for the first time on that film, and, you know, it was pretty fun. It was pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, it confirmed my genius. Is, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I made some correct choices is what it confirmed. Oh, know? absolutely. But uh, Dexter really, you know, is, is a, a compendium of my – experience in Hollywood. I mean, really, you know, he's uh Dick Dixer's a director and he's uh he's a racist, he's misogynistic, he's homophobic, he's all the isms. <laughs> he's an <laughs> he's alcoholic. Drunk, he's drunk the whole movie. A bottle of Jim Beam never leaves his head. Right. So it was a lot of fun to play it, you know. Uh it was born of several different conceits. I mean I worked with David O. Russell who directed me in a Kentucky fried chicken commercial. <laughs> and, you know, I was prepared to fight him that day. I had seen some of his, you know, him chewing out Lily Tomlin, et cetera, et cetera. He got in a fist fight with George Clooney. So, oh, you know, wow. I expected there to be a fight, but we got along. Uh, okay. But, mm. you know, that uh, dynamic on the screen of where there's a loose cannon like that, uh, you know, who, who's going to go off. Now, you know, at some point in the day, he's going to go off. He's going to lose it on somebody. <laughs> right. question is, is it going to be you? So, you know, you you learn how to you know, tiptoe a little carefully around these guys. And so that's really kind of where it came from. And then uh, I, uh, my cousin worked for a company called us the Asylum. And we were doing mockbusters, you know. And uh, so uh, I had this crew. And uh, I realized, you know, I can make this thing. And the funny thing is, is uh, years ago, I was in one of the first famous films, uh, Hollywood Shuffle with Robert Townsend. And he made that for $100,000 on his credit cards. Right. And it was a big, huge smash. It paved the way for him as a black filmmaker, you know. And it, it was really, it only took me 30 years to learn the lesson from it, which is make your own movie. <laughs> right. You know, here I am running around 
getting a part here, part here, you know, and uh, suddenly I realized, you know, you need to go out there and make the movie you want to make. So that's what I did. And I was interested in making a, a, doc, a mockumentary after being on The Office, right? I wanted to go show these people that I knew what I was doing. I'd learned how to do it and I could do it better than them uh, because of the pace that I did it at. I call it farce pace. If you're familiar with uh, old record players, right? They came at 16 speed, 33 speed, 45, and 78. 70. Well, this, this is a 78 right here. This is the speed we're running at. I mean, everything is an assault. There's a fight in every scene. There's nice. a conflict in every scene. So that's, you know, what we did. And uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. I hope people go watch it. Dick Dexter. You that's right. your ass off. That's where, right. They want where they can, Where can they watch it? Where can they find it? Uh, it's on Google Play. It's on Amazon Prime. It's on a, any place streaming, really. Just just uh, put it, Google it in there, and it's coming up. Dick Dexter. It's easy to remember. Right. The name, we, we changed it right the night before we started shooting. There was a The character's original name was Dick Dix, D-I-X-X. And that <laughs> happened as a result of walking down Hollywood Boulevard one day. I actually find... And there's a character uh, with a star named Richard Dix, Dick Dix. And I was like standing there right above a star going, Dick Dix, Dick Dix. This is a great name. <laughs> well, I get the script to his son, Robert Dix, who was a famous actor. He was in uh, Planet, uh, what, uh, a bunch of movies in the early 70s and late 60s. Some really strange titles, you know, Planet Nine from Outer Space, this guy's in. Oh, awesome. So he, he was, he's been around. So I get the, he's retired, living in Arizona. He reads the script. He threatens to sue me. Oh, shit. <laughs> because I use the name Dix. He's all offended, right? You know, I mean, right. I'm using this name. You, you can use any name you want, you know. But I, when you're making a little movie, the last thing you want to hear is lawyer. The last thing you want is a lawsuit. Right. You know, some, some clown, he's got money, time to sue you. He's going to do it. Right. So I'm laying there in bed and I'm going, yeah, what am I gonna, you know, because for a couple of years, all I'm thinking is dick dick, stick dick, stick dick, stick dick, you know, day and night preparing and working. And suddenly I just sat up in the middle of the night and went, Dixter. I knew what it was. And, you know, then after that, we just tried to cram it in the movie as many times as we can. I mean, I don't, I don't even know how many times we say Dick Dixter, but it's probably at least <laughs> 50 or 60. Gotta be a record. Every time it's we, you know, it's just one of those repeated tricks that you do. And so every chance we got, we used his name. Right. And that's, it's, it's, it's absolutely hilarious. Like Thank it's, you. it's one of those ones like, like Otis is it's, it's a, it's a cult com it, instant cult comedy class. It should like, be. It's, it's, if you, ha if anybody watching, if you haven't seen it yet, go watch it now. Yeah. yeah. Tell your friends hilarious. about it. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and your I, grandma. I write, write a review, <laughs> buy, buy a copy of it. I mean, support it. I mean, I, I'm still waiting on it to, you know, but I haven't really been, you know, I'm not one of these guys out on the media doing social media and all that kind of stuff all the time. I mean, it just not right. it doesn't interest me. Uh, people will find it if it's meant to be found. You know, it's like right. Psycho yeah. Cop or Bob Fans. I mean, you, you, when you try to push it, 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 it maybe it doesn't happen as when you want it to happen. It'll but do, it'll, something happens eventually. Right. Yeah. You don't have it out there. I mean, the work is good. Uh, really, really good. I mean, I worked really hard on that. I can't tell you how hard I worked on that. I mean, it was years of work. Uh, it, there's no, I edited that. I mean, it, I wow. kind of frame of it. Well, uh, it, I mean, it definitely shows. It definitely shows that you put a lot of, a lot of love and a lot of thought into it. Oh yeah. It. If you go that's from the original good. script to the, what, what ended up, I mean, it's, you know, Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> the, 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 it's funny. I met Harold Ramis, right? The great Harold Ramis. Oh, he wow. came to a screening of Phyllis's wedding at Greg Daniels' house. He walks up, first thing out of his mouth is he says, Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. I look at Harold Ramis. I go, that's my line. <laughs> Good. Good. Harold Ramis is. But I'm watching Harold Ramis watch this episode, right? So when I tell Michael, if you ever lay a finger on Phyllis, I'll kill you. That was straight psycho cop, by the way. Uh, That's awesome. Well, Harold Ramis, he just kills Harold Ramis. I'm, so right there, I'm like, okay, I'm happy. I can die happy now. I, I just killed Harold Ramis. But, uh, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> what was the point of this story? <laughs> <laughs> I had some point. To, oh, Harold Ramis said, the happiest day of your life is when you wrap the film. The worst day of your life is when you watch the first assembly of it. And that is true. I mean, I watched the first first assembly of uh, Dick Dixter was two hours and a half or two fifteen, 
And of course, you can't, the comedy can't be that long. But I mean, I was just appalled. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> what have we done? <laughs> I mean, I was really screwed up from it. I mean, I was hurting from it. I was like, I cannot, what? But I just went to work. You know, I, uh, the work just began right then. I was, right. you know, all along the line, I kept thinking, okay, the work is over. Oh, no, 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 no. Just kept getting more and more and more. People ask me all the time, do you like being an actor or a producer? And I'm like, an actor. <laughs> <laughs> being a producer, you know. Somebody, they said to me, uh, uh, can, can we get a line through on the, you know, uh, on, on the movie? And I'm like, well, who's going to do that? <laughs> You're looking at him. Who did it? It was me. Nobody else. I mean, who are you going to turn to? It's the producer. It's me. I got to deliver it. You know, the, right. the distribution company wants that. You got to give them the goods. So somebody had to do it. Right. Some, right. Somebody had to. Right. You've, all, you, you've also done some uh, voice acting, some voiceover type things. Uh, I've, I've pondered possibly uh, doing a little voice. I think you have a great voice for that kind of stuff. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, good, good. it's a whole a whole thing. I and I'm out of Hollywood now. I don't live there anymore. I I left after I moved out last June. I was done with California. I, you know, I, I'm enough enough after 40 years of it. It's it's just not a happy place to live in right now. And right. so I'm back in the hills in West Virginia, and I'm happy as can be to be out of it. If somebody wants yeah. to give me a bucket of money to do something, I'll consider it. I mean, I'm still paying my dues. I, I didn't want to <laughs> for years of paying those screen actors. You go, oh, damn it. So there was a big bill build up and I was like, oh, I'm not going to pay it. And then finally right. I, I read something about the office coming back. I was like, ah, oh, better, not better because it'll make me join again. You know, so, I better pay it. so <laughs> you know, what has that union ever done for me? I mean, that's all I want to say right now. Right. Well, I mean, okay, well, I mean, you mentioned, you know, being called back maybe from the office. Uh, was Bob Van? Bob Vance was just a kind of a pop in character from recurring, what I, from, a recurring character, from, yeah. but he kind of became a regular. Well, not really. Sense. I mean, and regular would have been in every episode. Every episode. <laughs> I mean, I just came into the parties. That's the only time you ever see me is whenever they're having a party, I'm there. Bob is there with Phyllis, you know. And, uh, all I'm doing is reacting usually to Ma Michael. I mean, I always called it, I said I uh, I patented it. It's called perplex consternation. That's, <laughs> that's all I had to do was just look at him like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know? So that's that it. Is what I was going to say. Too. say to me all the time, uh, why doesn't Bob just beat Michael up? And I'm like, okay, first of all, it's not funny. <laughs> okay. Second, it's no contest. That would be over before. Right. Even, I mean, right. seriously, come on. That's right. not, not even. Uh, come on. And so, that was my where do we go from there? You know, I want right. more appearances, not less. So right, I'm right. trying to be it's on good. those guys' good side. I don't want to beat him up. <laughs> I'm right. kissing you, his ass whenever I can. You wrap him like a pretzel. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That was that was one of my favorite. That was one of my favorite ones. Was uh, the Christmas party where where Phyllis was as dressed up yes. as Claus. Oh um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That what the hell, Scott. Um, I would have me laughing my ass off. That was one of the, again, another one of the best ones. That, I mean, I, I don't know what, like, it was just one of those ones that popped to me. Did I just, I just found that scene so damn hilarious. And my wife and I, we we watch The Office literally every day. Yeah. Like, so I mean, like, it's uh, it's it's one of those ones that yeah, that one, and then the, the the other scene that you were talking about, that one really. That was probably well. There's been favorite. some good ones. I mean, uh, we made a, what we make 187 episodes of that thing. I mean, it, you know, I mean, there's so many of them. It's hard to keep them all straight anymore. But right. Uh, I mean, there's some. I mean, some that stand out above the others. I mean, Dinner Party has to be one of the greatest pieces of half hours of television ever. Oh yeah, that I mean, one's absolutely. Of course, hilarious. that's based on uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, the great play. <laughs> Yeah. And, and with Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor, I watched it again a couple weeks ago. I mean, talk about <laughs> getting after it. <laughs> well, wow. I mean, I think there was some alcohol involved in that shoot. I'm just saying, you know, from the perspective of years later. So <laughs> Dick Dixter showed up to the party. To me to be <laughs> I mean, I'm not against, you know, doing whatever you got to do. I mean, Nick Cage was drunk as hell the whole time he was making Leave It Las Vegas. That was uh, oh. two, two fifths a day. Uh, by the time mm. he was shooting that, he started like wow. two months before he started shooting that. He started drinking. 
Oh, you're wow. playing drunk. You got to be drunk. You can't yeah. play drunk mm-hmm. in close up. That was one of Marlon Brando's big lines: "Was you can't play drunk in close up. You got to be drunk." So yeah. I told him, I met Marlon Brando one time, and I told him that I did that. <laughs> He's like, well, Bobby, I didn't actually write that. <laughs> that's, said, that's, yeah, that's those are your good. stories, Marlon. <laughs> I mean, that's I wasn't shy good. in those days. I'd go right up to you and talk to you. <laughs> so, so all right, then did you take your, you know, those words and incorporate that in the Dick Stick, Dick, Dickster? Were, oh, were, you, were, 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 you, know. were you drunk then? No, 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 I wasn't. I mean, <laughs> but uh, you did, I was you drinking. did play a good I didn't drunk. have one single drink the whole time I made that. That was just uh, iced tea and diluted Coke. Mm-hmm. Uh, being drunk, trying to do that. That was, we shot oh, that yeah. in six days. I, that, I mean, I, I had no schedule. I wasn't. Whoa. We made that movie in six days. Holy shit. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I all never would have guessed that. We wow. shot all of it in six days. So uh, that's there's no incredible. time. <laughs> you can't, you know, being drunk uh, is uh, depressed. You know, it doesn't work. I mean, yeah, no. I used to play no. golf with this friend of mine, and he had a drinking problem. And sometimes you'd see him over there taking nips out of this bottle, right? And then the next shot, he'd duff a three wood. <laughs> and he'd be like, what the hell? <laughs> right? be all upset. I'd be like, would you stop drinking? You can't play <laughs> golf when you're drinking. Come on. <laughs> I mean, you can't really act when you're when you're when you're drinking. You, you, right. You mean right. I always said, you know, about Robert Downey Jr. when he was using cocaine uh, back when he made Chaplin. I'm like, ah, that that performance is ruined now for me because every time I watch it, I'm gonna say, oh, he's looky looky look how high he is. Yeah. And I work with Tom Sizemore, right? Who was one of the you know who was a really bad when it comes to that stuff. Yeah. My buddy, I did two movies in a row. I did with him. I did. Uh, the Headhunter, which later was a, it's an Elvis movie, right? And then we did Stiletto. And so the Stiletto director said, should we hire him? Uh, what did those producers think of him? And I said, eh, they fired him and because he was using He was using meth. And he said, well, what could go wrong? <laughs> well, let's see. Everything? <laughs> you know, I, I get the phone call. They say, uh, listen, we're not shooting up at Universal tomorrow. Tom has been arrested up in Bakersfield. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he got busted with with meth with some hooker at some hotel up in Vegas. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> so I felt a little guilty there for a while. I was like, hey, I brought that. I didn't mean to bring this. But he and I almost had a big fight one night. He shoved me unexpectedly, and somebody was like, oh, Schaefer's going to knock him out. Because <laughs> <laughs> right. you got to say to me first, I'm going to put my hands on you, you know, because if I'm not ready for that, then I could go, you know, I could go flying somewhere. Right. So, I mean, there's rules when it uh, when it comes to fight scenes in Hollywood. And, uh, oh yeah, absolutely. He broke him. I mean, he was using. He wouldn't shut up that night. I was sick of him by the end of that night. He was. I knew everything about his dad playing football and his brother. I was. <laughs> I was ready. To, <laughs> I was ready. All right, shut up. <laughs> oh, man, but again, this guy, you know, he goes from making Private Ryan to now he's making these, you know, low budget B movies. I mean, because he's using. So, yeah, I mean, right. he had a bad accident on a movie last year where he, uh, the stuntman said, do not try to drive that car out of there. And he did. And he hit a guy and put him in the hospital. I mean, that kind of thing is just irresponsible. And he gets what away could go that. wrong. So, a lot of that kind of stuff, irresponsibilities in Dexter. Yeah. Right, right. Again, Dick Dixter, go watch it. Yeah, Every go watch it. <laughs> now, you, 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 you mentioned <laughs> Universal, so I have to ask. Uh, oh yeah, Universal Monsters. Uh, your your favorite. What's that? The Universal Monsters. What, what about what, what? What what is your favorite? Do you have a? Favorite? Oh, I guess Frankenstein is the. You know, I mean, I, I go back to those. Those are the things I watch, creature feature. But I wasn't really a kid of the movies. I, I never wanted to be a, a, in the movies. I never wanted to be an actor. This is an accidental career, okay? I just, after I was in it, I determined to be the best I could at it. I mean, that's all. And oh, the right. other thing is that they couldn't make me quit. Uh, but, I mean, I wasn't really a creature feature guy. You know, I mean, on Friday nights, sometimes we'd stay up and watch some of that stuff. But uh, I was an outdoor guy. I was a basketball player. So I wasn't a TV kid, you know. Um, and I was a reader. Reading is the most important thing that actors do. Okay, right. People don't understand that. Uh, the more you read, 
<laughs> the more you know, the more yeah. plays you read, the more books you read, the more, you know, I mean, those are all things that inform these character choices that hopefully you get to make. Uh, so the better reader you are, the better actor you are. Sure. Now, uh, the play True West, yes. um, I believe, had something to do with the whole psycho cop. It's a huge part of my life. Uh, I mean, I got psycho cop because of it. That was the audition piece at the psycho cop. Wow. They, they weren't, we weren't reading the script. We read True West, and I already knew it. <laughs> I'd just seen Malkovich and Sinise do it. I had worked on it in class. I was too young for it wow. at the time. But I knew that part, and so I didn't even have to look at it when I read it. I mean, I, I tore that thing up. I, I booked that job immediately. That's and, awesome. Uh, then later, I did the 20th anniversary out in Pasadena of that show. I mean, after that, I mean, the Quaid brothers did it. Uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman did it on Broadway with John C. Riley. I mean, this play is a real test. And so I loved it. I mean, the power of it is just, it's incredible. We were in a little, <laughs> little space and I refer to it as shaking their peaches because, you know, Lee's a drifter. He's a drunk. He, he's a fighter. He's a bad boy. And uh, he's, he's, a, he's very loud. And this is a little space. So, I mean, you get to use all your gifts. I mean, it, the, that's the thing about theater acting is that you get to do it for two and a half hours straight, consecutive, nonstop. Don't mess up, right? The pressure. Right. And film is, you know, you screw up, you can do another one. <laughs> right. Let's do right. another one. How about if we do yeah. another one? So, uh, you know, especially with video now, we just, we just keep rolling. I mean, before you just have to cut and re talk about it and do all the, you know, the film stuff. But now they just, that video is so cheap, they just keep rolling. So you go from the mistake right to the next take. So uh, that's one reason I love that play so much. And uh, again, uh, so here's a funny story. You know, I, I like telling this. I met uh, Sam Shepard's ex-wife, Olan Ray is her name. <laughs> you remember that name, Olan. You don't run into that name very often. Well, it turns out she's the producer of this play. So I'm up for this play, and they keep bringing me in, bringing me back, and I want to do this part. So they said, well, it's up to Olan. So I say to her by way of conversation, oh, I just read about you in this biography of your ex-husband. She goes, oh. Why were you reading that? <laughs> and I was like, well, I was doing the 20th anniversary of True West out in Pasadena. And she goes, oh, are they still doing that? <laughs> like, yeah, like they still do Hamlet and Macbeth. Right. They're right. still doing it. And 100 years from now, they'll still be doing it. And like so cats. That night, I get a call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said, yeah, yeah. Listen, I talked to Olan. She just doesn't think this is going to work out. <laughs> so I was at that point. I was happy. I was like, "All right, the, the hell with it." Can you imagine right. what a pain in the butt she would have been for the two months of rehearsals? Oh my oh, yeah. goodness, that, oh, that's, 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 that's hilarious. hilarious. You know what work yeah, with. they're still doing it. <laughs> no. <laughs> Now, now, Bobby, even though you said you didn't really want to, you know, getting into acting and being an actor wasn't really your type of thing. You never envisioned yourself no. doing that. No. What about, but you did end up going to acting school. Would you, do you think that that is needed for anybody uh, who has ever thought about it? I mean, do you have to spend the money to go to acting school or is it something that yeah. you can probably learn on your uh, own? Yeah. Yeah, there's a craft, there's a technique. Can you repeat it, right? Great golfers can repeat the swing under pressure. That's what actors do. They repeat the take under pressure. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn how to do that. You have to learn how to save that energy to do that correctly. I mean, there's a real technique to it. I mean, if, if not everybody's Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> right, you absolutely. You guys are. Morgan Freeman, Robert Duvall. The truth tellers, I call those guys. I mean, they, they, they have the goods. I mean, I was watching Jeff Bridges right before I came on with you guys. And uh, the, the film was called uh, To Hell and Back. Uh, he's so underrated. I mean, he's so good. It's effortless. Mm -hmm. You know, he's been doing it his whole life. I mean, he grew up doing it. You watch, right. I watched Last Picture Show, which is one of my favorite movies ever. And uh, because Timothy Bottoms is a buddy of mine. And uh, so that last picture show, I mean, I always measured. That's when I first got interested in. I was like, what are these guys doing? You know, this is a I mean, that movie really woke me up to film, I think. Uh, and of course, Civil Shepherd. Uh, 
at the time, you know, <laughs> the pool scene. I'm like, oh, can we watch that yet? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have VHS. You know, that was it. It was just sort of a lingering memory in your brain. Right. Like, Wait a right. minute. Didn't she take her clothes off? Right, right. <laughs> Uh, could could there could there be a uh, Dick Digster too? I don't know. I mean, Richard Grieco originally said to me, "Let's make this a series." He was at Showtime. He makes this thing, American Gigolo, or some crazy thing, and uh, I said, "A series," <laughs> but you know, I resisted. I resist lots of things, and then I go, "Okay, yeah, that's a good idea." I mean, you could do a half an hour with that. I mean, that would be uh, Absolutely. 24 funny minute, weekly minutes. You know, I mean, that right. world is, and that world, that's actually, that's not that far from the actual. I mean, yeah. I know there's a few smudge marks here and there, but really, I mean, when he's casting, that's what it's like. That casting is, you know, except for the fighting. <laughs> you know, and that guy deserved it. He had that coming. Uh, well, you you did stomp <laughs> on his dick. Away, I, mean. I kicked his butt. <laughs> Just oh, stomping man. there. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, man. That, that 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 was that was that was awesome. So yeah, what yeah, what what, what would you? I, I I don't I don't know. I, maybe I did ask this already. Do you prefer comedy or horror or? And then a two part. Uh, major films, full length feature films versus sitcoms. Oh, well, I like films, I like feature films. Uh, as far as comedy or drama, comedy is obviously a lot easier. I mean, in, in some respects, I mean, on the on the psyche, on <laughs> it's not easier in the terms of the execution, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. People always, when, you know, the Steve, what's Steve Carell like? I was like, he's busy, <laughs> he's working, mm -hmm. he's figuring out the next scene because the workload was so high, you know, um, both serve their purpose. I mean, Hollywood makes about 500 films a year, right? And how many of those are good? 10. Yeah, right. true. 10, maybe. What's that? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. right. I mean, it, it's depressing if you look at what they're churning out, but every now and then the lightning will strike. There'll be a, a well-written piece and a well-directed piece and a well-acted piece. Cause you gotta have all three of those things. And, uh, they forget about the uh, well written and the well, the well uh, acted most of the time, and they're they're all about the directing of it, you know. And so uh, that that's Marvel, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm right. Not into those films, in a nutshell, uh, <laughs> those aren't real films to me. Those those are <laughs> comic books. Those are cartoons. Uh, I agree. I don't see that as real filmmaking. You know, the 30s and 40s. There's a reason they call that the golden era. I mean, I, wa I watch a lot of Turner classic movies, and people yes. actually talk in those movies. <laughs> right. I mean, they're 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 real movies. I mean, so right. Uh, that era is sadly is not how we do it now. Uh, you know, right. That's a, recently we've been we were doing a a, a series on uh, the Universal the Universal monsters. That's why that's why Otis asked you earlier which which was your favorite one. Frankenstein. And, I, and, I like and, Frankenstein. Right. 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 That's and, a Universal and, monster, right? Right. Yeah. 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 And, and But like us going back and doing all this research and me, me, you know, I watched them as a kid, but rewatching all these yeah. as an adult, it's, 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 like I said, it's, it's, they had something, I guess it's I, maybe soul. I don't know what it is, but yeah, that's a good word. It, it, yeah. the, the, most films nowadays just don't have. And the yeah. film, but the film audience wasn't as sophisticated either. That era. True. I mean, you have to look at those things about when they were made and apply that, you know, to 1930s America. That's a different world. Right. Uh, 100, almost 100 years ago. So, right. uh, I, yeah, I mean, if you look at it in that historical context, I think you can, you know, obviously the decades. Right. <laughs> each decade turns out a certain type of film, as it turns out. And uh, I'm not so sure that the, uh, you know, the 2020, uh, <laughs> 2020s are going to be well remembered. Right, right, we'll right. Not like, not like the seen. 30s. Not like it's the It's an 30s. all or nothing proposition now, right? You either, uh, it's all, I mean, the way films are made now, they're made for China, actually. So that's the, that's the really terrible part about it. But the audience, there's 1.4 billion people there. That's a bigger potential audience than 330 sure. billion. So, uh, you know, films are made for... <laughs> the world not america anymore so th right. that's why you can't really make you can't make little movies anymore and hope to uh hope to make money at it 
Because we, the, we, the distribution model is not there. I mean, right. the big films, they get all the screens, and a little film has got no shot, no chance. I yeah. mean, uh, Six Lies and Videotape was at one time the most successful low-budget film of all time. It, it mm-hmm. was made for a million bucks. James Spader, you know, had a good cast. And they uh, they grossed $25 million. So it was huge. <laughs> you know, uh, My Funny Greek, Greek Wedding, another one, that one – I mean, they made that for six million or you know less than that, and they did four hundred fifty million worldwide. I mean, that's a huge. I mean, were, the legal battles still aren't over all, on that one. I oh, mean, everybody's wow. suing everybody over, over the money on that because there's so much of it, right? So uh, now, I, and I remember talking to that uh, producer Larry Estes, and I was pitching him something, <laughs> an action film, and he said, "How much? What's the budget?" And I said. Well, it's five million, and he goes, "You can't make a movie for five million. You can make a movie for one million, and you make a movie for ten million. You, there's no life in between, none. You can't do it for two. You can't do it for three. You got to do it for one or ten. At ten, you got a chance to get distributed. At one, you got a chance to, you know, to get a breakout in, in the art houses. And so you have to factor all those things in when you uh, when you go about go about making these things." Yeah, I got we we got we got about four or five minutes left, and I came across a uh, a story that I don't think I've heard you tell, although it was mentioned in uh, previous shows that you've been on, and that's the breakup cameo. For you know, most people know cameo <laughs> is something where you you can. <laughs> You, you can, you know, um, you know, pay an actor. He'll wish you a happy <laughs> birthday. He'll, you know, just say hi. How are you? You actually had the break to. Yeah, I did. Up. I, and I, I thought that. I was really good at it because I had, I, I, you know, I was I practiced that before in, my, in real life. <laughs> I, drew, I drew in real life. It, it's really not about me it's about you <laughs> no, that's, not, <laughs> that's not how it went uh no i uh i i had some you know some practice at that so i uh i was able to you know bumble my way through that one oh, yeah. did yeah. you ever it's, get any feedback on that on how that no, went that one no thankfully no <laughs> i don't really <laughs> like feedback <laughs> i don't really want feedback if i wanted feedback i'd you know I'd get in another business Right, right, oh right. man, right. Oh man, it was hilarious. I'm oh, stunned. I mean, like, funny. I have to ask you guys, who put you up to this? Why in the world would Jack you ask me to do this? Somebody <laughs> put you up to it. I want to know who it is. Is there an ex out there? Right, you know? Well, okay, you get what you ask for. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, it's it's been a been a hell of a time. We and we appreciate yes. you uh, taking your time oh, and your day to. I'm an okay. expert at these things. And we're talking about my career, so. Right, I mean, you know, it's not a career; it's life. I mean, it's not a career; it's a life. I mean, people that think of it as a career, you better rethink that. It's got to be a life. You've got to do it totally. There can be nothing else. Mm, nothing absolutely. else. Absolutely, it, it, it's it's total. Yeah, it's total immersion. You have to, you know, say goodbye to everything else. I did anyway. I mean, I'm jealous of the people who were able to have six kids and the wife and the house and all that, and still do the thing. Good on you, <laughs> bastards. bastards. <laughs> and I'm better than you. <laughs> so there you go. Hey, that's like it. my that's my it. commitment is much more total. There, there you <laughs> go. There you go, my now, friend. Now, so I hate actors that talk about acting. Right? I, it's one of the worst topics you can ever talk about. So I try not to, you know, pontificate about it. But like you said before, yeah, you you need to have that training. Uh, I mean scene study and, and uh, improv training and all those things are going to be very useful. Um, and you need to do theater because that's what real acting is. I mean, mm-hmm. right. I had this kid I, and my teacher was Peggy Fury and she was the most famous teacher in Hollywood at the time. And there was this guy and he kept doing the scene and the goal of this class is to only do the scene once or twice. You don't want to do it three or four times because everybody got sick of it. So he kept doing the same scene over and over. And she finally sat him down and she said, you know, I've been talking to you every week about you need to do this, do this, do this. And she said, I suddenly realized you want to be John Ritter. <laughs> <laughs> and John Ritter was a nice guy. I met John Ritter and I liked John Ritter. And it was a shame the way he died. That was medical malpractice at its worst. Yeah. He was a very funny guy. And later he turned out to be very dramatic in the Sling Blade movie. He was terrific in that. Absolutely. That was, was yeah, really that's one of my really favorite good. roles. He was friends with Dwight Yoakam. And uh, so Dwight, you know, 
put him in that role and he was he was great that's awesome jackal monkey any any final words for uh Mr. No, Schaefer. I mean, and other than other than thank you very much for for joining us and, and I'm a huge fan. Like I said, thank we you. watch we watch The Office every night and uh, enjoy. Every, everybody who hasn't seen Dick Dixter, go watch it. It is a comedy, instant comedy classic. You will laugh. It is hilarious. I promise. Uh, yeah, you I laugh promise, out loud. So. Multiple yes, you times. <laughs> I guarantee it. Oh, oh, oh. No why? <laughs> I guarantee it. The the scene with Teddy. <laughs> no, never mind. <laughs> now, I hired him because he fit perfectly into the Rock'em Sock'em Rotobops. And I was like, that's going to be funny. So Perfect. when I'm cutting that, the editor goes, let's shorten that up. And I'm like, no, let's make it longer. <laughs> let's, let's make the, 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 the noises longer. I want to hear the punching. Oh, and so he's man. like, no, you don't need to put any sound effects in that. I'm like, yes, we do. <laughs> that's funny. That is, that, that is, that is very funny. Every time you kick him in the nuts, the director says to me, uh, did we do it once too often? And I'm like, let's do it again. Let's do it again. <laughs> let's do another one. I'll take not one not enough. One more time. One more time. I think we kicked him in the nuts six or seven times. And every time, you know, it hurts. <laughs> As it should. Oh, and well, so, well, you know, you get a laugh. I mean, if you don't laugh at that, then I think there's something wrong. There's oh, something yeah. definitely there wrong, and especially if you out. don't if if you don't laugh at the guy whose name uh, Hug Nuts. Hug Nuts. I mean, Hug Nuts. Now you know. Is, I hated that name. <laughs> <laughs> is is that real? <laughs> Hug Nuts got in trouble, didn't he? Oh man! Hug Nuts paid the price. Hug Nuts oh. paid the price. He got he got a That's good a, old you know, fashioned Frankie, dick stomping. Uh, he works in uh, soft, uh, soft R or R rated movies, a lot of them. And so he, you know, is experienced with that. So he's kind of a Frankie Cullen. Uh, we had an actual porn star in that role. Uh, I forget his name, but he had long hair. He looked like uh, uh, Fabio. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it didn't work out. And so we ended up uh, using Frankie. But uh, that other guy's pretty well known and i came across his work one day and i was like well i'm glad we didn't hire him <laughs> <laughs> oh man oh my goodness oh my goodness well we're hey we're about out of time robert uh, thank you but I, I i i want you to hang on just for sure. a minute we're just going to throw you in the uh back chat i want to we both want to say goodbye uh off uh you know the uh the, the show Thank you again for taking the time out my to uh, speak with us. And sure. uh, hold, hold tight, my friend. Man, that that was absolutely awesome. What I mean, what what a what a funny guy. What a I mean, great stories. Yeah. This is what people like legend. to hear. Yeah, I mean, and this is what In people like to hear. All the backstories and everything. This has been an absolutely awesome show. I want to thank everyone over there at Scurry Face uh, that has watched us yeah, over there. Everybody, in, everybody there. Night of Living Dreads over there on our Facebook group. Uh, thank you guys uh, for checking it out. This will obviously go over on our YouTube page, the Night of the Living Dreads podcast on YouTube. Um, hey, Jackal Monkey, man, you you hit the bullseye again, man, with this guest. This uh, Robert was is such a yeah, Bobby. I mean, I mean, yeah, so, such such an amazing guy. I Dick, mean, an awesome, and the, I mean, an awesome guy, awesome actor, and and I mean, just all around good, good fucking dude. I mean, this is this has been one hell of a show, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Absolutely, and uh, hey, we uh, I, I got we we got a little special announcement that we'll make after the show, but there has been a little change with our uh, Saturday show over there at Scurry Face. It's going to come on um, uh, a Sunday. day or uh, yeah, oh, uh, I think Monday. I think was the or was it? I don't know. Sunday or Monday? We'll we'll figure it out. But right. it is not going to go live just because. Uh, our, our guest, uh, Marcus, uh, Marcus I, yeah. yeah, um, he, you know, they have to do it on agreements and stuff, yeah, yeah. certain, certain times. And we have to, you know, go through a few things, uh, there to make sure it goes off without a hitch. So, but that's coming. Don't worry. Writer, director, night of the living dead part two coming 
to NLD. So with that being said, thank you guys in the chat. Thank you, everyone who joined in. Uh, we're going to get the hell out of here, and we're going to go uh, talk for a few more minutes with the uh, Dick. <laughs> Dick Dickster. Dick go watch it. Go, go watch it. You, you, you better. If you don't, I'm coming after you. All right. We'll see you guys soon. Later.